Um, Mark's been a member of the Computational Sciences Advisory Committee for a number of years and a friend and ally of CSRC. Um, he's currently with Cortex Solutions. If I remember correctly, it used to be Signal Source Solutions, if I'm right, Mark? Source. Source Signal Imaging, source signal founded, founded by Richard. Yeah. By founded by Richard Greenblatt, who's also here today. And so today he's going to talk about calibrating models for EEG and MEG inverse mapping. And without taking any more of his time, Mark, it's all yours. Thanks, Archie. Um, is the uh, volume coming through okay? Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, this talk is about the inverse problem for electric brain waves, that is EEG or electroencephalographic potentials, and for magnetic brain waves, that is for MEG or magnetoencephalographic fields measured outside a human head. Given electromagnetic measurements outside the head, a problem is to infer the spatiotemporal distribution of macroscopic ionic currents in the brain that likely would have generated the observed electric potentials and magnetic fields. In, in one way or another, I've been engaged with this problem since 1990. So uh, that's 30 years, a long time. And uh, now at this later stage of my career, I think I can see a solution path forward much more clearly than I have before. Uh, but the path I envision is a whole research program that would essentially need three things. First, interdisciplinary collaborations. And uh, second, fresh intellectual energy from students. So the CSRC and the CCN are uh, great for both of those. Uh, third, my home base is a small business, Cortex Solutions. So uh, we serve brain research labs. And uh, so the path forward has to be commercially viable. Uh, business side is essential, but that's a different kind of talk. So let's get started with the inverse problem. Okay, I apologize for the uh, dense. Um, text on this slide, but uh, my purpose is to put the AEG and MEG inverse problem in the context of a series of high profile United States national research initiatives. Uh, I'll skim the surface, but anyone who's interested, uh, there are some uh, numbers here in purple square brackets. Yes, and I, I have those references in a PDF file I can give to anyone who wants to dive deeper. So start with uh, up here, Brain 2025. So the Brain Initiative is a grand challenge, in the words of former President Obama, uh, to accelerate the development and application of new technologies that will enable researchers to produce dynamic pictures of the brain that show how individual brain cells and complex neural circuits interact at the speed of thought. So um, it's about developing tools for brain research. Uh, brain 2025, this document is, uh, it's an inspiring document that identifies seven high priority research areas. Among, of the, among these is high priority research area five, which uh, I think probably Terry Sanofsky named it this Theory Modeling Computational and Statistics, or TMCS for short. And under Area 5 is a section called 5E-2, Multiscale Integration of Data from Different Experimental Techniques. And underneath that one is a topic, Solving High-Dimensional Inverse Problems for EEG and MEG. So let me just read what it says there. It's, it's a pretty good introduction to the inverse problem. Uh, in humans, high-density EEG and MEG recordings are easily obtained. If they're interpreted as limited by the inverse problem of assigning sources for signals. Many underlying patterns of brain activity can give rise to the same observed pattern of EEG or MEG signals at the scalp. It's ambiguous. 
EEG and higher resolution fMRI are now being collected simultaneously in humans, providing an opening for substantive progress on the inverse problem. The solution would enable more incisive interpretation of human brain signals and their relation to cognitive processes. It's on page 94. It's a, I find it an interesting document. Now, so that's, that's a pretty high profile grand challenge type US initiative. Another one is the Human Connectome Project. Um, uh, to quote this original reference number two, it's a systematic effort to map macroscopic brain circuit and the relationship to behavior in a large population of healthy adults. Uh, so rich MEG and multimodal MRI um, data sets from this study are available online at humanconnectome.org. Um, the original part of the study is completed, but the HCP lives on as longitudinal studies across the lifespan. For example, there's a developmental study ages 5 to 21, um, but this study doesn't have EEG or MEG. Same with the lifespan HCP and AG, uh, ages 36 to 100 and beyond. Um, I tried to choose, I said I was too young, which made me feel good. They're really looking for people in the uh, upper brackets there. Still no EEG or MEG. Another very, very large study, it's a 21 site study. Um, all the analysis takes place at using that's called the ABCDs or Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. It also doesn't have EEG or MEG. Okay, uh, moving on down to another initiative of the NIMH, that's National Institute of Mental Health, called RDOC, or Research Domain Criteria Initiative. Uh, this is a multi-level science logic framework for developing new classifications of mental disorders. It spans genes, molecules, cells, circuits, physiology, behavior, and self-support. So it's supposed to go across everything that makes up our mental health as human beings. And circuits are considered to be, brain circuits are considered to be central. Finally, I want to mention the uh, NIH Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program, a more friendly name for it, is All of Us. Um, I actually joined this one. It's a, um, uh, it's a nationwide research program to engage one million or more persons longitudinally for at least 10 years. All of Us aims to accelerate health research and promotes individualized prevention treatment and care. Uh, it includes individual genomes, electronic health records, lifestyle data. But those of us who participate are recontactable for future studies, which could potentially add, for example, neuroimaging, EEG, or MEG. So um, what I was hoping to do here was sort of show a chain of links from the Brain Initiative to the Human Connectome Project, to the NIMH RDOC, to Precision Medicine, um, which motivates the approach for the rest of this talk, which is uh, approaching the inverse problem from the perspective of precision medicine, which is about individual human beings. Okay. Let's get going on the actual topic here. So here's a brief Introduction to the neuroelectromagnetic inverse problem. We're given spatiotemporal measurements of electric potentials on the scalp or magnetic fields close to the head surface. And from that, we want to infer the spatiotemporal distribution of macroscopic ionic currents in the brain that would have generated the observed electric and or magnetic field. So um, shown over here is a simple case. Up above, we have a, um, an MEG recording. This is a somatosensory evoked petiole field 
recording, uh, you, you can see it has a uh, um, dipolar field distribution, which obeys the right-hand law uh, rule. And in this particular case, we can fit that nicely with a single equivalent dipole shown down here. So this is this simple case where we might be justified to include that the inverse problem has a unique solution. However, um, most interesting brain activity is far more complex. Uh, so in fact, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz demonstrated in 1853 that, uh, in the words here of, of Monty Hamelainen and colleagues, a current distribution inside a conductor G cannot be retrieved uniquely from knowledge of the electromagnetic field outside. So the general case, so this is the general case, but it's even true for the single dipole solution we showed on the previous slide because most of the ionic current flows in the brain called primary currents are magnetically silent or electrically silent or both. both. The best we can hope for is to solve the inverse problem for those distributions of primary currents which do generate measurable electric potentials or magnetic fields. Uh, the example on the previous slide arguably might do this. However, complex distributions of currents throughout the brain pose another difficulty, even when each local current generates an observable measurement. That is, the inverse problem is severely underdetermined when the number of unknown currents in the brain swamps the number of EEG or MEG sen sensors. Now, to surmount this difficulty, it's necessary to impose additional constraints. And the next slide provides an algebraic diagram for thinking about this. Richard, Richard Greenblatt, uh, proposed the use of commutative diagrams in this 1993 paper as a way to think about the space of inverse solutions. A diagram commutes if two pathways of arrows with the same beginning and end are equal. So for example, here, these two arrows, F to G, and commutes with this arrow from A to C. Um, in, <clears throat> Here we have uh, G as a gain mapping from the space of source currents in the brain to electromagnetic measurements outside the head. Uh, the pseudo inverse going the other way around makes use of so-called dual spaces here with, with asterisk um, and the transpose of the gain matrix. Uh, Richard proposed a model-dependent solution that assumed a finite number of discrete primary sources at fixed locations within a bounded conductor. And importantly, he used covariant statistics derived from measurements to determine the metric on the space of possible sources. As far as I know, this is the only paper I've seen at least that uses commutative diagrams to pose and solve the EEG, MEG inverse problem. I find this approach to be very helpful and I use it for the rest of the talk. <clears throat> so everything that follows in this talk will be organized around this commutative diagram. Uh, source space X is in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, T is for time, F for frequency, S is for state. Um, sensor space Y is in the upper right corner with subscript E for EEG, M for MEG. Uh, there are two gain mappings, G sub E for EEG, G sub M for MEG. And these have tissue conductivity parameters gamma. Uh, as in Richard's diagram, uh, the dual space uh, 
Dual spaces are in the lower right and left corners. Uh, the vertical arrows are determined by covariance statistics. Uh, sensor covariance statistics on the right and source covariance statistics on the left. And what I call the core consistent down here results from following the arrows in their forward directions without inversions. So, um, uh, C on the left, so C goes, forward arrow goes in this direction. But if we follow it around this way, all the arrows still go forward. And the diagram commutes, so this relationship holds, and there's nothing to invert in that relationship. Hey, Mark? Oh, yes, yes, Sachi. Well, it looks like some audience members are having a lag that they're still seeing the previous slide. So I don't know if you want oh. to unshare oh. share again and see if that fixes oh. the problem. Okay, let's see, stop share and start again. See. Oh, hi, Jerome. Uh, share. Jerome can tell me what a dual space really is. Okay, let's see here. I want to share this one. Can you see it says linear inverse solutions preview? I can. You see oh. mm. I can see it. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So um, here uh, in this uh, so in this uh, on this slide, I'm highlighting a uh, general linear inverse mapping. So we start with a vector in uh, sensor space, and we have one inversion here, so we, we follow the arrow this way, uh, uh, C inverse, or if it happens to be um, singular, then, then uh, plus indicates that we condition it appropriately. Uh, the plus C sub N is for adding some additive noise in sensor space. Okay, so uh, we follow this arrow this way, and then the other arrows go forward. So we have G, this one, uh, G transpose, and omega. And uh, so the only inverted arrow is, is this one um, on the, the sensor covariance side. Mm. And this is, this is exactly what John Mosher, Sylvain Bayet, and Richard Leighton found for what they, they called the uh, generalized linear solution with priors. Okay, so their no, notation is a bit different, uh, but it's, the meaning is exactly the same. Here, uh, L is for a lead field, which is equivalent to what we call the gain matrix G. So um, this solution includes uh, minimum norm type solutions uh, where, the source, where the source covariance matrix here in their notation C sub J is taken to be primary. Also includes beamformer type solutions where the measured covariance matrix, what they call the data covariance matrix here, is taken to be primary. Okay, so let's take a little bit deeper dive into source space X. Anders and Marty Serino, as you know, uh, cross the, the road from uh, the CSRC. Uh, <clears throat> they made a vital contribution to this field with this night. 93 paper. Uh, one key contribution is the use of anatomical constraints. So in their words, a common assumption is that much of the EEG and MEG observable at a distance is produced by currents flowing in apical dendrites and cortical granule cells. 
because of the columnar organization of the cortex, the resulting local dipole moment would be oriented perpendicularly to the cortical surface. So that is just considering the cortical hemispheres for the moment. Source space can be thought of as, an ex as extended on the two-dimensional convoluted cortical surface with currents flowing perpendicular to the surface as illustrated in this schematic here by Fernando Lopez Silva. Um, so this represents the uh, cortical layers. Here we have a pyramidal cell. And when these pyramidal cells are synchronized, they can generate a net current dipole, which could be observed potentially with the EG and MEG. Um, shown down here is a, um, uh, so, so when inverse solutions are mapped onto a cortical surface like this, the, the solutions uh, can be like this one. This is a complicated uh, face perception study by Ksenia Marinovic. Um, uh, so it's, this whole solution is distributed over both hemispheres. But you can interrogate, for example, here, uh, left and right fusiform cortex and, and get a time series out of it. Um, so note that the inverse solution itself needs to be performed on the unfolded cortex, but it's convenient to display the solution, especially uh, parts of the solution in the cortical. Uh, sulci uh, using the, the inflated cortex. Okay. Um, yeah, so now we'll take a bit of a dive into the sensor space. And here we have, um, here we have our, our favorite distributor in Japan, uh, Mr. Otsushi. Shirasawa, um, and he is participating in a, a combined somatosensory potential and field recording in the lab of Dr. Akitake Kano of to Tohoku University in Sendai. So this uses a, a RICO um, MEG system that has 200 axial radiometers. Now, clearly in this case, uh, the MEG sensors have more density than EEG scalp electrodes. Now, this is somewhat typical because EEG measurements tend to be messier than the MEG measurements. However, the following slide is a reminder that EEG electrode density in coverage is a basic consideration. This uh, this shows the results of an approach for generating nearly equidistant spacing of electrodes on a given scalp surface. So the, uh, the, top, the top row has 25 millimeter spacing, 20 millimeter spacing here, 15 millimeter spacing. So uh, this has actually been used uh, um, to make physical electrode layouts, but I also suggest that it would be useful for making computational simulations, that is to of electrode density and coverage. Okay, so um, those are the two ends, uh, source space, uh, signal space, or sensor space. And now let's, um, let's take a dive into this gain matrix. Uh, so in order, this, this is a matrix, but in order to solve for it, uh, all solvers ultimately go back to Maxwell's equations as shown on the next slide. Okay, this is a classic paper by Mati Hamalainen and other very distinguished uh, MEG researchers who hail from Finland. Um, uh, I recommend it. It's, it's very, it's, it's about 100 pages, and it, but it's, it's uh, uh, it does a really nice job in this section. So he starts with 
He starts with Maxwell's equation. And then um, the, uh, the, the quasi-static approximation is used. It arguably holds for bioelectric phenomena with frequencies below 1,000 hertz. Um, thus, the time dependence of Maxwell's equations may be neglected. And as a result, the result for the electric potential fields uh, shown here in equation 18 in the form of Poisson's equation. In general, this sigma is a conductivity tensor. Uh, for example, current flows preferentially in the direction of white matter fibers in the brain. Uh, the magnetic field can be obtained from equation 16. Um, note that it includes uh, contributions related to uh, volume currents uh, like EEG, but it also has this term, which is a direct contribution from primary currents. So therefore, compared with EEG, MEG is less sensitive to conductivity geometry. <clears throat> Okay, so this slide shows four kinds of forward solvers. <clears throat> In the upper left, we have analytic solutions. For example, uh, here we're showing spherical geometries. This is a nice paper by Zhang, 1995, for an arbitrary number of nested concentric spheres. <clears throat> so these solutions are fast, and they may also be used to ch check numerical errors of more general uh, solvers, such as uh, this one in the upper right, the boundary element method. Um, this is the most common numerical approach with head geometry information derived from anatomical MRI. It assumes a series of compartments with uniform conductivity, <clears throat> such as a brain compartment, the cerebrospinal fluid layer, which happens to be very thin. Uh, a skull layer and a scalp layer. Here in the lower left corner is the finite element method. It can incorporate tissue uh, conductivity and isotropy. Um, I recall some time ago when Richard did some studies like, like this one. Um, and the, the finite element method is uh, considered to be state of the art. In the field. Now, um, in the lower right corner, I'm showing the cover of the book by Jose and his, his uh, co-author on the mimetic finite difference method. And um, to my knowledge, this, this has not been yet applied in this field, but it would be a great project for an interested student. Um, the mimetic method discretizes field operators in a way that preserves key properties of continuous operators. For example, the gradient operator that we saw in Poisson's equation. Thus, it theoretically might outperform the finite element method in some ways. All right, moving on. So this is um, circling now the dual sensor space. And Later on, maybe uh, Jerome can give me a better lesson on this because I'm not a proper mathematician, but I have an intuition behind it. Um, so, well, dual sensor space is, is a space of linear functionals on the sensor space. Intuitively, I think of it as a decorrelated sensor space. Uh, that is the, the, the actual Sensor measurements are correlated. For example, two closely spaced sensor, sensors tend to be more correlated than two more distantly spaced sensors. And these um, correlations are captured by the covariance matrix C, circled here. So um, uncorrelated measurements in an idealized dual sensor space are mapped to the actual sensor space via the covariance matrix C. Okay, now let's consider the possibility of deriving C also from a model. 
Um, and in particular, we'll pay attention to this state parameter. Um, can we somehow model latent states S from the data? All right, so I, I became aware of this work uh, from a video conference Society, Society for Neuroscience put on last year. Uh, Scott Linderman at Stanford uh, gave a really nice tutorial introduction to this. And he's applying it to neural data on a much finer scale, but it seemed to me that it would fit, it would fit the, uh, the EG case to a T. Um, so uh, what's it all about? So uh, a multivariate Gaussian process is essentially linear process. Um, but how, how, could this, how could this be generalized? Well, the, the way they do the switching linear dynamical systems is they have continuous states here each one of these states corresponds to a multivariate Gaussian process like our covariance matrix C. Um, but there is a generally small number of discrete states. So when we're in this state Z1, it uses one covariance matrix. If we happen to be in state Z2, it's a different covariance matrix and so forth. So the dynamical system switches between different linear systems. Um, from one covariance matrix to another, and uh, machine learning methods are used to infer latent states, as described in this paper here. Uh, the red arrows here provide a recurrence which improves the behavior during a dynamic switch. So here in this picture, it's a toy, but interesting toy example uh, using the Lorentz attractor. So you could think of this as two states. So with the, um, when, the, when you're in this state, this could be modeled by a covariance matrix. When you're in this state, you could be modeled by a covariance matrix. And switching back and forth between these can be handled by the ordinary switching system. But um, the, uh, the recurrent method with these red arrows improves the behavior in the uh, regime of the switch. Um, and also in the EEG world, um, there's a long history going back to Dietrich Lehman and others uh, of EEG, MEG microstates. So it uh, seems to be re receiving more um, interest of late. So getting back to the uh, inverse problem, the idea would be to have a different covariance matrix for each state, to, to use this method to model states and use a different covariance matrix for each state. Okay, once again, uh, my students might find this it's interesting. Uh, here's another um, way of making use of the covariance of the, uh, the sensor space. So, um, here, now this is data from uh, uh, Tsushi Shirasawa shown in the earlier slide. And um, we can see his um, somatosensory evoked field and his somatos simultaneously recorded somatosensory evoked potential. And um, making use of just the cross covariance part, the EG, EG cross covariance part, uh, and this decomposition we can look at calling co-resonant co modes. So this is an example of the first co-resonant mode, which is just about everything in this case. But um, you can see that the waveforms here are identical waveforms, but the units here are picotesla, units here are microvolts, and these are the different uh, spatial distributions for that mode. How might this be useful? Uh, let's see, yes. Okay, so um, up here, our numerical methods uh, took care of the physics part of the problem. 
and, and we, we got the geometry from MRI, but the gamma parameter conductivities are, are not provided uh, from MRI. So how might we estimate or tune these uh, conductivity parameters? And so uh, going back to 1998, uh, Manfred Fuchs and his um, team uh, proposed a way to do it, actually using, using somatosensory evoked fields and potentials, but basically by assuming that the common dipole source is indeed common, therefore attempting to tune these parameters until the EEG dipole aligns with the MEG dipole. And various other researchers have followed that up and used it for, for example, uh, uh, some of these other numerical methods, tuning it up. Um, however, the, the SEP and SEF, it's a very specialized program. So, uh, paradigm, I should say. So, um, on the assumption that the common part of the, so, so we don't know this omega in general, but if it's common, if, if a common omega is generating the common part of the electric and magnetic fields that we derive from this part, then um, we can do a partial inverse. So in other words, this omega, let's if we go from here to here. Uh, and if omega is common, we can, we can attempt to align even a distributed solution, even with complicated data, potentially, that's the theory, um, by aligning the, the, elect, the uh, EEG inverse solution to the dual uh, source space with the MEG solution. And if that works, uh, a nice name for it would be EMMA, electromagnetic model alignment. And um, that's another possible topic for uh, student interest. Okay. Source covariance modeling. Okay, so this, this is a more challenging but interesting problem. Uh, and how could we model this one? So in, in this paper, um, the authors treat this as the prior of a uh, Bayesian estimator. And they also provide ways to, to estimate it from the data it, using this relationship here. I also uh, attempted this uh, myself in this, this paper. Um, the idea is to uh, use the covariance matrix itself as data. So this is estimated obviously over a longer period of time, using it as data um, to estimate some parameterized model of the source covariance matrix. So <clears throat> this lambda is, is, would be, represent some uh, uh, parameters of the model to be determined. Okay, so what might the model consist of? Okay, so uh, the Human Connectome Project that I mentioned early on uh, came up with this parcellation of cortex into um, 180 areas per hemisphere of parcels. So each one of these parcels has a corresponding parcel on the opposite side. They say that they can do it in individuals. So individuals' parcels might be somewhat different, but, um, but it can be done for individuals. So to begin with, the source covariance models might make use of these parcels for an individual, and then assume that covariances within a parcel are more highly correlated than covariances between different parcels and perhaps also there could be a parameter for the correlation from a parcel in one hemisphere to its corresponding parcel in the other hemisphere. They're connected by a big fiber uh, bundle called the corpus callosum.
Okay, now um, I don't know. Don't know if we have anyone from uh, Axel Mueller's uh, brain imaging development lab with us or not, but I found this paper and I thought it was really interesting. Um, Ash is the first author. So essentially, um, we were talking about states in sensor space. And here in this paper, uh, the researchers at, at San Diego State um, did something called dynamical functional connectivity to identify states in, in the brain. And so they identified these four states and they showed that there were some differences between uh, uh, typical development and, and uh, autism. So um, notice here, these matrices are really um, uh, at a higher level. So these are connections, say, between areas as shown here. This would be another level of the hierarchy. And so um, you could have parameters that take fMRI information at this level as well and, and attempt to fit those. So um, it's also intriguing to consider that these states might correspond to latent states estimated from, from sensor space, as we briefly discussed earlier. OK, so this is my last slide. Um, in this last slide, I'll return to the inverse solution and consider Consider these three mappings. So we have the gain matrix, we have the sensor covariance matrix, the noise, I haven't said much about the noise, but that's another consideration. And we have the possibility of modeling of an overdetermined model using this relationship and guided by functional MRI potentially with simultaneous EEG and fMRI. So this is, this is the most difficult challenge here. But if we had models for all these three, then uh, we put them together, we, we could obtain a hybrid of model-based, which is like minimum norm, and the data-driven, like beamformer-like, estimators and uh, here in this paper with uh, Richard and Alex Asachi and, and myself uh, suggested the possibility of, of hybrid inverse estimators. Um, <clears throat> here um, what I'm suggesting is that we have individually calibrated models. Think again to the precision medicine scenario where we're really trying to go deep into an individual's own brain and tune the models to that individual participant. So we would get each of these models, G, C, and omega, for each individual participant by collecting some calibration data. OK. Uh, Another topic, the major topic, how would we in the world go about validating these inverse solutions non-invasively? Uh, this paper by uh, Lopez in the lab of Gareth Barnes has an intriguing suggestion, which I don't have time to go into. Maybe that's uh, for another time. Um, uh, so that's, that's it. Did I leave enough time for questions? Okay, now it's time for questions. Please unmute yourself and feel oh, free to ask questions. Okay. Wonder what. 
I wonder what you do with the solution when you find it. What? Uh, that's a really good question. Okay, so um, EEG and MEG, going back to this grand challenge of the brain initiative, why does it, why would the brain initiative be so interested in this? Well, functional MRI uh, gives great pictures and dynamic pictures of that of brain activity, uh, but it's at very low temporal frequencies, typically uh, 0 0.1 hertz or less. So um, that's not at the speed of thought. You might have recalled it when the former President Obama described the brain initiative, he talked about the speed of thought. Really, uh, currently, the only methods we have available for millisecond temporal resolution brain activity are EEG and MEG. Now, um, if you can still see on the screen, est estimation of the source covariance matrix is also very interesting in its own right, but it requires temporally integrated data. So it's not at the speed of thought either, um, even though it potentially gives interesting information in itself. This estimator here, combining these together, can provide um, millisecond resolution. If, if I go back to, uh, I don't think Xenia is with us here, but if I go back to this one. So essentially, you know, with such, an, with such a solution, you could put like a virtual probe somewhere in the brain. That's hope. And then you can get millisecond, notice these are in milliseconds. Then, then you can get source activity on the order of milliseconds, which is arguably at the speed of thought. Uh, then, so you can use it to study the brain. Um, you could also use it in um, neurofeedback type scenarios. So because it all boils down to a matrix, matrix operations are fast. It can be done in real time, you can minimize the lags, you can actually estimate source activity in real time, either for someone else to observe or the participant possibly feeding back, say listening in. Maybe the participant is uh, learning to tune in to one of these brain areas and maybe you sonify it, you know, give it some sound quality or something. So you're listening to it like neurophysiologists used to live, listen to neurons. Richard used to do that too. Um, so like listen to brain activity, potentially is that, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But, um, but it does yeah, pretty much, although I don't see real uses there. I mean, maybe potentially understanding stuff way down the road, but what do you really do with it? What's it good for? Other than more research. Oh, other than more research. Okay. Well, um, there, there are the, the most, the most uh, common clinical application. So I was, I was trying to, uh, going back to this slide early on. Um, so I was emphasizing the mental health research, and now this is research. So another thing you can do is that this is the starting point for modeling on a finer, on a neural circuit level. So there is a brain initiative project that was funded called the Human Neocortical Neurosolver. Uh, Stephanie Jones at Brown is the PI on that. Uh, and it starts with inverse solutions like this, and then it proceeds to model, um, to, mo to, to do a neural circuit model. So that's one. But Although I emphasized NIMH, uh, by far the most common utility of this today would be neurological, would be epilepsy. Um, so um, 
uh, epilepsy uses uh, EEG brainwaves. Uh, some, some places also have MEG. And um, uh, to get to the activity that's in the brain, they often will implant. If, if it's a serious case, it's not, it's not um, uh, managed by uh, uh, drug therapy. Um, then it's necessary to maybe sometimes have an invasive measurement cut into the brain and put the, a grid somewhere and actually record in the brain to find out what's the uh, focus or epileptogenic zone. Uh, then you need to place the grid somewhere. Where do you place the grid? Well, EEG and MEG can give you an idea where that might be. So the subsequent exploratory surgery can place the grid in a, in a good place. Um, so that's the most practical clinical application today. Uh, but I think, you know, the reason the Brain Initiative is interested in this, uh, Brain Initiative also considers clinical applications. And NIMH, um, it's obviously a lot more complicated mental mental disorders. Let's take the present situation. Let's take uh, COVID-19. There might be an increase of um, depression, anxiety. Uh, lose your job or you're anxious about losing your job, for example. Um, it could trigger in somebody who was maybe mildly on the edge, it might go over the edge and become a bona fide um, clinical situation. And that certainly would require research. I'm not saying there's a clinical application for that right away. But that's what this RDOC initiative at NOH is about, is to try to get to the level of brain circuits. And you really can't do the brain circuits except by first solving the inverse problem and then using something like the human neocortical neurosolver to then do neural network model circuit modeling. Uh, I don't know if that helps anymore. Uh, that was very helpful. Thank you. Oh, great. May I ask a question? Sure, Richard. Uh, the whole reason, the whole motivation, it seems to me, for all of this algebra is because the inverse problem is all posed. That is, there are more unknowns than knowns. But if you reduce, if you use that fMRI parcellation that you showed near the end, um, you had on the order of 300 or so uh, sections, 300 or so regions, I should say. Exactly. And yeah. so you're getting up to the the, um, the number of sensors. So, I mean, it's still yeah. be a well-posed problem, but it seems to me that that's the real, uh, and then you can make some assumptions about the covariance, like you're saying, that, uh, I mean, maybe they're not exactly the assumptions that you were making. That's something that will evolve over time. But, but then <laughs> that's the whole purpose of this algebra is to make the problem well posed by making certain simplifying assumptions and this seems like a really nice one that you don't have to worry about all this algebra really you just have fewer unknowns than knowns i mean the other way or well yeah or on the order yeah it's yeah. definitely getting into that into that territory yeah this is um some of these some of these areas uh like like this one, for example, they're long and thin. So um, they might have sub areas. It might not be straightforward to treat these long, thin areas as a single region. Although they could be, but maybe. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's one of the things that's really inspiring by this human connectome project parcellation is that it kind of gives the sense that this might, we might be getting, you know, to a level where we could estimate activity at the level of these cortical areas. Hey, Mark, this is Sachi. 
Hi, Sachi. This may be a naive question. You showed the sites or the locations where you can put your sensors. How do you decide among those sites where you want to have MEGs versus EEGs? Oh, okay. Are, are you talking about, oh, like this one, for example? Okay, well, okay, so here, this is a, um, in this lab, I do believe they're interested in, in epilepsy. So, so the, the MEG sensors are built inside to this, uh, to the helmet here. And there, there are 300, 200, 200 uh, that cover the whole head. So that can't be just, it's designed to be sort of really, uh, to cover as much brain activity as possible. The EEG is a little different because I notice with the MEG, you just put your head in the, in the helmet. There's no physical contact. That's why MEG researchers get spoiled really easy. And although most of the rest of the world has access to EEG, it's a lot messier. And so it takes more time either to put them on like this or to have a cap, say a cap that would have a spacing like this. So the point of this slide here is that really it kind of needs to be studied. So if you have a region of interest um, that you're targeting, you might not need all of these. You might be able to design a layout based on the theory that tells you where to put the EEG the electrodes uh, that would be optimal, uh, small number that would be optimally placed for targeting certain brain regions of interest. But um, that's why the theory and the modeling could be really helpful here. If you don't have the theory of modeling and you're just wanting to cover the whole head as, as, as much as possible, then you, you put something everywhere. I don't know if that got at your question or not. Yeah, thank you. Well, other questions from audience members? I have a question. Uh, hi, Mark. This is Afruz. Hi, Afruz. Hi. Uh, and thank Congratulations, you uh, Afruz, uh, Dr. Uh, Jahidi. You. Uh, how do you pronounce your, your last name, Afruz? Uh, Jahidi. Jahidi, Dr. Yes. Jahidi. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a kind of um, sort of naive question um, since I've uh, I work a lot on, with fMRI data, but not with uh, EEG data. So I don't know how especially like, um, uh, you know, the signals that you uh, gather is more from the cortical surfaces, surfaces rather than more deep. Mm. Is that, uh, is that, for example, would be problematic for, uh, like mm -hmm. disorders like epilepsy or stuff. I, I don't know exactly um, what are the domains yeah. for EEG, but um, but uh, I'm wondering how like the future of this research is going, given that it can record the uh, surface cortical activities uh, compared to the like a deeper tissues in the brain. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So um, the um, uh, the cortex is, is the primary generator of what, of what both EEG and MEG can see. Now, there have been, uh, actually, um, Marty Serino's working with someone on, on the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, uh, 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 there's a researcher at, uh, I think it's MGH in Boston, who's working with Marty. And Marty provided a very hot, dense, high resolution extremely dense high resolution cerebellum. And with that, the researcher was showed that it's possible with both EEG and MEG to image um, activity in cerebellum. Um, deeper structures, well, thal thalamus, um, sometimes a very early, for example, somatosensory, it might be possible to capture a volley. Uh, 
it, get, it gets more con controversial fast when you get to the deeper structures. And that's where, um, getting back to the, um, uh, the human neocortical neurosol, that's so I could find it, but if you want to search for Stephanie Jones at Brown, human neocortical neurosolver, you can include in the network that you're modeling, for example, thalamus. We have thalama cortical circuits. Even if EEG and MEG aren't estimating thalamic activity, you include thalamus in your neural network model. These are biophysically realistic models. Use the neuron software and uh, yeah, so they're biophysically realistic model, circuit models. Um, so you can estimate activity in the cortex, and then with the thalamic cortical loop in the subsequent stage of modeling, you might be able to make inferences about something in the thalamic cortical circuit, something of interest. But my opinion is it's, it's, it's difficult and it needs to be proven if you're going to estimate something in deeper structures, except I was pretty convinced by what I saw at the cerebellum stuff. Um, but I'm usually personally pretty skeptical of imaging deeper structures like say basal ganglia with EEG and MEG, although people do claim to do that and they have uh, their reasons for you to do that. So yeah, fMRI gives you more the, the whole picture at a lower temporal resolution, but you get the whole brain. Yeah, so, EEG, yeah. so, so using MEG, um, does it help to kind of capture more like, like deeper structure in the brain uh, compared to the previous EEG or uh, still you have the same challenge uh, uh, with EEG? Well, yeah, so there are, there are researchers um, in a recent workshop I attended that are claiming to see deeper structures with MEG. It also depends on the kind of sensor. So, for example, this system is a, uh, an axial gradiometer. It's a gradiometer, so it's detecting differences out here. There are magnetometers, which don't perform the differencing operator out here. And uh, they, um, in principle, can see deeper activity than the gradiometers can. Uh, EEG can see deeper activity. Um, uh, the other thing with MEG is the deeper you get, the more the head surface appears to be a sphere from the depths. And the more sphere-like the head is, the more the currents are radial, and MEG doesn't see radial sources, EEG can. So for that, that's another reason why it's sometimes believed that EEG can see deeper sources better than MEG. But ultimately, you want to put them together. And EEG and MEG together could, in principle, and there have been papers on this too, can see more than either one of them. Alone. However, I'll add only EEG. You can only do EEG in the MR scanner, um, not MEG. So you can you can record EEG simultaneously with fMRI. Um, but I can't imagine how you could do that with MEG. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Actually, can I can I jump oh, in? Oh, Xenia, yes, please. Hi, <laughs> hi, Mark. Uh, a terrific talk. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you for uh, uh, for explaining the the whole problem, the inverse problem, in such great detail, and also the importance of the method. Uh, if I can just add, um, this really we cannot study many things. Uh, Mark has mentioned epilepsy. We cannot study sleep. Uh, at all. Uh, we cannot study, for example, cognitive functions uh, without this kind of an approach, just because in the brain everything has these spatiotemporal 
uh, stages. And fMRI just cannot get at that. Uh, and ultimately, MEG and EEG are the only method we have other than, uh, you know, invasive intracranial EEG, of course, which is uh, uh, essential and a gold standard for localizing some of these generators. But non-invasively, uh, these are the only methods that are really respons or re responsive uh, to or rather that capture neural activity directly. Uh, so, for example, you can also not study very well uh, pharmacological influences on the brain. You know, fMRI is not good at that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I think, I think this is really a key method. And I think that some of these models that Mark has talked about, I think, are doing a really good job at uh, uh, estimating these generators. In our work, for example, we have compared fMRI, we have done fMRI studies in parallel with uh, to MEG and EEG studies and then compare the estimated generators. And it really works quite well. So these distributed uh, uh, models, I think, work, work quite well that Mark has talked about. But Mark, let me just ask you something. Um, you know, and, and we have we have uh, collected MEG and EEG data at the same time. That's that's done that's done quite uh, regularly. Uh, what is your you know you you are I totally agree with you that e that including EEG in these models is is helpful, but the problem, of course, is with the biophysics of the EEG signal. Uh, because, for example, the, uh, you know, CSF is five to 20 times more conductive than the brain tissue, and the skull is a poor conductor. It's about 70 times, if I remember right, poor as a conductor. And so how, I, I think a big challenge in these models is deciding, and I know there are some numbers out there, but that's not, that's not very well understood. You know, what kinds, what, what uh, conductivity values would one plug into these models and how many shells would one need to use and so forth, you see? Yeah. To account for the conductivity issue for EEG. MEG does not have that problem. Right. So, so in these, in these equations here, so the, the MEG, can sense the primary current directly, and then there are these so-called volume currents, which are similar to what comes from uh, this equation up here. But EEG, you only see EEG through the whole volume conductor. What you see at the end has gone through the whole volume conductor, whereas MEG has a part, depends on that too, so MEG does depend partly on the conductivity uh, values, but there's this term the prim the, where the, the primary current goes directly through that makes MEG so much less sensitive to the conductivity geometry. So the idea here is um, the idea of this, this is to um, tune um, in this. In this, I'm, I'm using gamma instead of sigma. It may, might be better to put sigma in there, although it's sometimes used for sigma. But whatever. This, the idea is to tune these parameters using EEG and MEG together. And so, um, if we can estimate the common, the common part of EEG and MEG is usually not considered interesting. Why? Because if it's, it's the intersection of EEG and MEG. So it's, it's smaller than what EEG can see by it, and, and smaller than what MEG can see. It's the intersection of the two. So what use might that intersection be? Well, it could be useful for tuning these uh, these conductivity parameters. So the idea is yet to be uh, yet to be demonstrated, but, but made some steps toward it is to use this the common part um, 
And instead of using a, the kind of paradigm like this one, somatosensory evoked field and evoked potential, where to a really good approximation, you have a common dipole source. And with that method, you can use uh, the method of Fuchs et al. And others have used this, where you basically tune the electric head model until the electric dipole matches the magnetic. I shouldn't say electric dipole and magnetic field. It's, it's a single di current dipole, but the dipole estimated from the electric data and the dipole estimated from the magnetic data until they align. So the idea here would be to use even maybe some of your more complex data, like your face per perception data, for example. Who knows what the common part of that is, but if we could estimate the common subspace, and then that, if the common subspace is generated by a common source of variance, we can sort of cancel this part of the inverse solution out and just do this partial inverse and align in a distributed fashion to the cortical areas of interest. That's, that's the intention. Uh, so ultimately, we can use MEG to help tune up the head model to make EEG the EEG volume conductor more accurate for EEG. That's, uh, that, that's a hope that maybe with some, some encouragement uh, that it might work. That, I, I, don't, I don't know if that was going where you wanted, but. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I know that there have been also some models uh, with, uh, I don't know, animal brains, you know, big brains and so forth to try to calculate these, but the devil's always in the details and this is not a simple issue, but I really like your, your uh, uh, approach. I think it's elegant and it relies on this HCP model I, I agree that there are going to be some issues with, for example, these elongated structures and so forth. But on the other hand, there are some some of those tiny, tiny little, uh, you know, regions of interest, right? Tiny little uh, pars parcellations that are not going to be very useful because ultimately MEG doesn't have that good of a spatial resolution. But nonetheless, I think it's it's going to be really terrific for uh, understanding in a principled way the spatiotemporal stages of processing, which uh, we need to have realistic brain models of pretty much any function. Thanks. Thanks for that. All right. If there are no questions, I want to thank Mark for a really nice uh, lecture and for the discussions. Usually at this time, we would, I would invite you to join us at uh, Eureka, but because of social distancing restrictions, I have to do it all by myself today. So, Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mark. And thank you. Okay, all. Thank you, Sachi. Thank, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll have a beer on your name. <laughs> okay. All right.